In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Matthew Tawadros uh, with us. He will be speaking, abide in me and I in you. And uh, may the Lord give you the grace and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to speak to us all today. But, okay. My brother Kareem always says, when you give a talk, you don't want to... You don't want to prepare too much because you want to leave some room for the Holy Spirit to talk through you. But the problem is sometimes you might leave too much room for the Holy Spirit to talk to you, <laughs> depending on how much you prepare. But I have some points here and I'll go through them. Um, I looked at the passage that Abuna gave me or Tant Mariam gave me. Somebody texted me and said, speak about abide in me and I in you. And I looked at the passage and then I looked at the fathers and then I took what I could from them and I tried to put them in, down on a piece of paper, um, maybe coherently, maybe not so coherently. I guess we'll find out as I'm speaking. Um, but maybe the best route to take is to just start with the passage. So I'll just read it because I have it in front of me. It's John 15, uh, verse 1 to 4. Um, it's, I'll just start it. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit you're already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me and glory be to god forever amen and that's as much as uh i'm going to be looking at today so um i read it and the verse that stands out to me is abide in me and I in you, most likely because that's what somebody told me to talk about. So that's why it stood out to me. But the first thought is, um, it's, the first thought was like a big how, like how can I abide in you, especially looking at my own everyday life um, and knowing the multitude of sins I commit and how sinful I am. And like, despite coming to church and uh, knowing God and having a relationship with him and like since I was a youth like or a kid someone telling me like you know you ought not to do this or this is bad for you or this will pull you apart from God um, I still find myself constantly sinning so the first question I asked myself was like how can I abide in you when I myself am like such a sinner and you are without sin and I think the answer to that comes first at the uh, cross and this makes sense if you like consider when this was stated by Christ. This takes place immediately after the Last Supper. Christ washes the feet of his disciples. He um, performs the Eucharist with them. And then uh, we go about a chapter and a half after is this. So this is taking place immediately after the Last Supper. Um, and there's some fathers who comment about this, how it's Christ pointing towards what he's saying, abide in me and I knew, takes place at the crucifixion. St. Anthony says, you know, uh, God became man so that men may become gods. Um, but why is this and how is this and why is this necessary? Um, why does he even need to take flesh? Um, well, we know the story that sin enters into the world as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, and mankind becomes separated from God. We think, we often think the sin itself is, oh, um, you know, they ate from the tree. The, the sin itself is disobedience of God. The sin itself is, they were at a point prior to the fall where they were in communion with God, in relation with God, and they were longing for God. But the sin is they no longer hungered for God. They no longer thirsted for him because they disobeyed him and did something that uh, removed themselves from God. And we say that because of this, Christ had to come and redeem us and provide us with salvation. And he takes on the flesh and he dies in the flesh and rises so that we can be saved. Um, and there's this really interesting question that I think comes up that we don't really ponder too much, but we often hear the word ransom used. And I think, have you heard the word ransom used? You guys have probably heard the word ransom used um, because I don't want to say we often hear it used and then nobody's heard of it. But even uh, in the liturgy, 
And as a ransom on our, our behalf, he gave himself up unto death, which reigned over us, whereby we were both bound and sold on account of our, of our sins. So the question is, um, ransom, when you think of ransom, you know, what do you think of? Um, typically, you think of uh, some, I think of a kidnapping. Typically, when I think of ransom, I take something that someone admires belongs to and or belongs to them and I ask them for an amount of money um, in order to then give the thing back. Um, this is not related but it's really interesting. I did uh, a presentation once on how eventually you become like uh, so wealthy on earth that there are people who have uh, kidnap insurance which is like, should they become kidnapped and the person pays, declares a ransom, the insurance company agrees, okay, we'll pay X amount for them and they pay for this kidnap insurance. It has nothing to do with this, but I just think it's the most interesting thing ever. Um, and nothing I will never ever need to worry about, hopefully. <laughs> so that's what we think of when we think of ransom. At least it's what I think of when I think of ransom. But in the Greek, ransom has a very different meaning than as we now interpret it. In the Greek, um, ransom meant to save from something that's oppressing somebody, to save them from it was to ransom them from it. Like it wasn't this, it wasn't focused on this transactional approach of, okay, I give you this and you give me this back. Um, and if you understand ransom in that sense, it becomes uh, it becomes to make a lot more sense as to why we use the word ransom and why Christ uh, gave himself up as a ransom on our behalf. Um, there's fathers who, who think of, well, who's the ransom being paid to? Uh, St. Athanasius, St. Athanasius is, is one of them. Uh, and I think St. Basil also contemplates it a lot. And he says, who's Christ paying ransom to? We have a few options here. Like you could say, like some might say Christ is paying ransom to God the Father. And he says, like, basically, like, how dare you say that? Because how could you say that God the Father is oppressing us? And then he says, well, like, okay, it's not, let's cross that off the list. It's not that. And then you say, oh, well, like, you know, uh, maybe it's to the devil. But then he says, how can you even say that then the devil has some power over God that he is holding us captive um, away from him? But, and how would God then give in to the power of the devil? He says, that doesn't make sense. So it's not God the Father, it's not the devil. So who is Christ paying this ransom from? Who is he, uh, like we said, the term means to save from as they understood in Greek. Who's Christ then uh, freeing us from and saving us from? They say the power of death. Uh, St. Athanasius says this and St. Basil, I believe also says this. Um, the thing which oppressing us was death. Um, and when Christ then takes on and assumes our flesh fully, like not, uh, not like he's any less of a man than either of us, he becomes fully man while maintaining his divinity. He then, when he rises in the flesh, we get to now partake in the new life with him, in this resurrected life. Um, and everything Christ does up until his death and resurrection is keeping in mind our salvation. When we say Christ is baptized, we say he's baptized to wash all of mankind, not just to wash himself. Because what Christ undertakes in this body is then done to the rest of us. And what does that death and resurrection do? Well, we said that um, when Adam and Eve fall, they ultimately uh, no longer hungered for God. They built uh, a, a wall between them and God in the sense that they had uh, lost their connection to him. And Christ uh, allows us to then develop a relationship with God to now fully abide in him. As much as he's uh, present in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament, we now get to uh, attain what we call theosis, um, which is to partake in God by becoming one with him. Our, and we say the ultimate goal of orthodoxy is to attain theosis, to eventually become um, one with God. So this whole idea of abiding in him and him and me is really the whole pursuit of life. Um, and this idea 
of now you can have a relationship with God through the death and resurrection of Christ is um, very prominent. And um, to the extent that there's a father of one of the Eastern Orthodox churches, by father, I mean like he's a metropolitan, I believe, um, Alexander Shmemin, and he discusses, I was discussing this with Abuna last week when he told me you guys were going to Jerusalem, um, which nothing with Jerusalem, I'm sure it's a fantastic place, but he discusses how Christ, and I'll see if I can find the quote, but he ultimately says Christ is to some extent the end of religion because in the time before Christ, religion was a set of forms, a set of rules, a set of right and wrong in order to have connection with God. It was seen as you do specific things and you abide by these traditions and then you are God's people, you attain um, to, you attain a connection with God and you, you know him. But now it's not you do X, Y, and Z. There's no form as to if I do this and that and that and this, I'm going to then have a good relationship with Christ. I can come to church every single week. And if I'm not truly there and if I'm not truly present, if I'm not truly meaningful, it isn't going to benefit me much if I'm just standing in the pews and my mind wanders. Um, but he says it's the end of, Alexander Schmerman says it's the end of religion because we no longer care about pilgrimages or exactly what it is to do or X, Y, and Z. It's now, no matter where you are, you can have a relationship with Christ because he has broken down the door through his death and resurrection. Um, you, you know, we don't have to travel to a certain location every year or once in our lifetime to have a relationship with God because God is just as much present here as he is in Egypt, as he is in Japan. Wherever you go, God is present and you're able to have unison with him and live in Eucharist and live in communion with him because of uh, Christ breaking down that wall through his death and resurrection. And this relationship with Christ is accessible to you. The power to know God becomes accessible to you. Despite my sin, despite my flaws, despite my shortcomings, he's there. I can never do anything so great that God is going to reject my repentance or reject even having a relationship with me. And I can think of like plenty of times I uh, sin and I'm still, I still find that if I stand to pray, God is there and he's blessing me. He's pouring his grace upon me. Um, it's just the effort of I've fallen. I have now need to get up. I need to uh, repent and have a changing of the heart and turn once again to God. And we often think the standard is, you know, um, perfection. We think, oh, because I sinned, God isn't going to want me. God no longer loves me. Like, I feel so much shame that I can't even bring myself to go stand before God. And it's like certainly happened to me plenty of times in my life where I sin and I feel like I feel so much guilt and so much shame that I don't even want to... Um, bring myself before God. I don't even want to speak to him. Um, and it's, it's an awful mentality to have because in like the story of the prodigal son, he's waiting there for you to repent. And he's not just waiting at the door, but he's running out onto the street when he sees you coming. Uh, you, like, you know, we say, we just need to take like one step and then God is running towards us. Um, and the fathers contemplate just like with regards to sin and falling, the fathers contemplate how it's um, the devil kind of changes the order of emotions for us. He makes us, they say he makes us brave before falling into sin and then shameful after the fall of the sin. So brave before to say like the devil comes and he tempts you, let's say on any given day. And he says, you know, why don't you do this thing? And he makes you brave in the sense of I'm willing to transgress against God and do something that's going to um, lose my connection with him. That's going to pull me away from him. That's going to drag me down spiritually. And then after the fall, he makes you feel the shame in the sense that now it says the devil says like, look at you, you've fallen, you've done this against God. How's God going to accept you? And you feel so much shame that I no longer want to repent. Uh, and the father's contemplating, they say, you ought to feel the shame first and then the bravery after. And that's the proper order. Shame and that when the devil comes and tempts you, you ought to say like, how can I think of this? And how can I even consider 
transgressing against God? How can I even consider something that's going to hinder my unison with Christ, my unison with God, and going to prevent me from having a fruitful relationship with him? And then if you are not able to overcome in that instance and you do fall, he, the Father doesn't say you ought to then feel the bravery. Uh, the bravery of God is so merciful that despite your fall, despite your transgression, despite whatever you've done, because, you know, we all fall in short of the glory of God. We all sin daily, uh, multiple times a day. God is willing to forgive us. So the bravery ought to come after the fall in that you are brave enough to then go see your father of confession and confess your sins, to repent your sins, to truly try and change because that turning of the heart, God is willing to accept and he's willing to bless. Um, and thinking of like the struggle and falling and, you know, we get up, we fall, we get up, we fall, we get up, we fall. And I've shared this before here, I believe, but um, someone was, was talking um, about what is perfection. Abuna Anthony was talking about this, about what is perfection with us. And um, it's because the Bible says, you know, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And, uh, you know, we think this is such an unattainable standard to be perfect. Like, what does that even mean? And he was giving us a metaphor and he was saying like, uh, I don't know if anybody watches boxing. I certainly do not because it's too violent for me, but I understand a little bit about it. But in boxing, if someone uh, falls and they get knocked down, they have 10 seconds, I think. I think it's 10 seconds. They have a certain number of seconds to get up and rise. And if they get knocked down and they get up within those seconds, uh, they get to fight again. And if they ultimately knock their opponent down, and the opponent doesn't get back up, they win that match. Despite falling five times, they have won that match. Um, and if this happens like four times in a row, five times in a row, six times in a row, where they continuously get knocked down in the fight and arise and knock down their opponent, um, if they win all those matches, they're set to have a perfect record. Despite having fallen like countless numbers of times and being knocked on the floor by their opponent, uh, just by the virtue of getting back up and fighting and knocking down the opponent, they are then set to have a perfect record. So perfection is not the standard of, I do not sin. Perfection is not the standard of, you know, I'm never going to do anything wrong because Christ tells us that we are going to sin. Perfection is the getting up after the fall and being constantly willing to get up. And this is... A difficult thing to, to grasp the idea of struggle and that we are going to encounter struggle because so many times and often it's like taken hold uh in southern america very heavily of like should you follow christ things are going to be good um and we often call it the prosperity gospel of like should you go to church every sunday and you pray and you confess christ then you'll get you know the riches, you'll get wealth, you'll have a good family, a good social life, and everybody's going to love you because you do this. Um, whereas Christ doesn't promise a good life. He doesn't promise things are going to be easy. He doesn't promise if you follow him, um, you're never going to have any more worries. I think, uh, you know, he He promises the exact opposite of, uh, like, you are not of the world. The world is going to persecute you. Um, but then he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Um, so struggle is essential to the Christian fight. Um, there's, I'm paraphrasing very heavily, but uh, St. Anthony says something like, without tribulation, there's uh, no salvation, something to that extent. I can't give you the exact quote, but it's basically without tribulation, there's no salvation. And in Revelation, uh, it says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The prerequisite to, I will grant to sit with me on my throne is to him who overcomes. Um, so there's that prerequisite of acknowledging there's going to be a struggle, but with that struggle, you get the honor of uh, reigning and sitting on the throne with Christ, of having this unison with God. Um, and I love this verse because it's not like, to him who overcomes, he will 
be in the same room as my throne or to him who overcomes will sit next to my throne or to him who overcomes will see my throne from afar. It's to him who overcomes will, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. It's such close unison and so highly regarded and Christ has such deep love that although I'm not even worthy to sit in the room with his throne, he's granting me to sit with him on his throne. And I think the worry comes contemplating struggle and how i'll come back to this i'll come back to a second this idea of the vine but contemplating struggle i don't think it's a worry if you have um struggle and i think actually it's it's a good thing to have struggle in your life um there's a story from one of the western monks it's philip of something i don't i don't remember what the of is right now but uh it goes, there's this monk and uh, he struggled greatly with controlling his anger. Um, and he used to constantly pray to God, like, God, I take away this anger from me. I want to live a life of peace. And he's doing okay with controlling his anger for a little bit. And one day um, he is in the courtyard and one of the brothers does something to him and an argument ensues and he is so overcome with rage that he runs to the chapel of the monastery crying. And he then is praying to God, you know, please God, I've been struggling with this so, for so long, take this away from me. I no longer want to struggle with anger. Like help me to be able to control my anger. And so he's sitting there like praying over this anger issue for like an hour and he leaves the chapel. And immediately he, uh, as he leaves the chapel, he uh, sees a brother and it's a brother who like typically always loves him, treats him the best. He has a really good connection with this brother. And uh, the brother immediately starts causing problems with him, uh, talking down to him. And then, you know, he sees another brother as he continues to walk and tries to forget it and gets into an argument with that brother um, because something happened between him and that brother. And he found all these instances where he was becoming angry, where he could have been patient. And he runs back to the chapel and he essentially says to God, he says like, I was just in here for an hour praying that you take away this anger from me. Like it was, it was just a straight hour of this is the only thing I want. This is what I prayed for. And as soon as I leave, I find myself getting angry and I find myself surrounded by these things causing me to be angry. What is like the use of me having prayed? Like nothing's happening. And then, um, the story continues that Christ then appears and he tells him like, uh, Philip, I've, you prayed about this and I've given you these chances for your growth, for your spiritual growth. Um, and that's a paraphrase to some extent, but essentially that he prayed for his anger to be removed from him. And as soon as he left, there were things he saw that caused him to be angry. And Christ had placed these in his way um, or these had been there as opportunities for him to overcome that anger uh, so it's not that Christ is going to, I'm going to pray and say, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, this is bothering me. Lord, I'm having too difficult of a time with whatever. Can you remove it from me? Um, it's not that I'm going to pray for the removal of something. And it's going to be removed. It's not going to be that I pray for a virtue and I suddenly gain that virtue, but that through my prayers, hopefully I find the peace of Christ to then be able to attain those virtues in situations that may arise. That when a situation that would have made me angry uh, arises that I uh, show patience and I show the peace of Christ rather than getting angry. Um, so not that the situations themselves change, but that with my prayers, my heart changes. And struggle is often a time and an opportunity for God to allow us to grow, for us to exercise virtues, for us to gain that crown uh, of struggle to which God will uh, reward us in the life to come. Um, and I said, I think if you're not struggling, you ought to be worried one, because you don't have these opportunities for growth. If there's no struggle, um, if there's no temptation, what are you overcoming? But of course there is always temptation. And I think if there is no temptation, the worry is either you've become so accustomed to something that it no longer seems like a temptation because it's just become a a habitual portion of your life. Like um, if I give alcohol as an example, like uh, 
at first it could be something that you feel like, okay, um, I got drunk and then mm -hmm. I repented and I tried to change. But after so many times of getting drunk, suddenly it just becomes like a habit. Like we go out to the bar after work on Fridays for happy hour. And that's just the tradi tradition of, I am getting closer to my colleagues and I want to, I don't know, do well at work because sometimes you have to develop relationships with certain people. So you say, oh, I'm just going to the bar with these colleagues because you know I wanna get in good with the manager so that I continue doing well at my job or he sees my efforts or the next time there's an opening on X project, um, he thinks of me. Um, and rather than like at one point becoming drunk became something that was exceptional and then you turned away from, it becomes habitual to your life. Um, so either you should worry about struggle because it's become habitual and you don't really even realize the temptation and the sin anymore. Um, and I think this is the when sin when is full grown brings forth death, when you don't even think of your sins as sins anymore. Or you should worry when you find you're not struggling because if you found yourself growing closer to God and if you found yourself in unison with him and having a relationship with Christ, Satan would have sought to remove you from that. Satan would have sought to bring you away from God because what does the enemy ultimately want? He wants us to fall and to not have a relationship with God. So if you find you're not struggling, maybe at some point it's Satan no longer feels the need to tempt you because you're not growing closer to Christ. You're not growing closer to God. So I think, and I'm always told by my father's confession, the more you clo grow closer to God, the higher your temptation is going to be, the more difficult you will be tempted. Um, and I think we see this with, with uh, the monks and the desert fathers who we see Satan go um, essentially all out for it to try and make fall into sin. And as I was talking about, when you struggle, you're ultimately going to attain virtues and bear fruit. Um, this we can relate back to the vine and Christ being the vine. Contemplating on this passage specifically, I'll quote um, Cyril of Alexandria. They're kind of long passages, but I don't think I can do justice um, paraphrasing them, so I'll just read them. So Cyril of Alexandria says, unless the branch is provided with the life-producing sap from its mother, the vine, how will it bear grapes? Or what fruit will it bring forth? And from what source? For no fruit of virtue will spring up anew in those of us who have fallen away from intimate union with Christ. To those, however, who are joined to the one who is able to strengthen them and who nourishes them in righteousness, the capacity to bear fruit will readily be added by the provision and grace of the spirit, which is like a life producing water. Um, I'm gonna comment on it, but I'm gonna read one more passage from his same uh, commentary on this uh, portion of John. And then I'll comment on it. He says, shall we say that faith bear and alone is sufficient for one to attain the fellowship that is from above? Well, even the band of demons rise up to the fellowship with God since they acknowledge God's unity and have believed that God exists. How could this be? For the mere knowledge that the one God is the creator and producer of all things is useless. But I think it is necessary that the confession of piety toward God should accompany faith. For one who does this abides in Christ and will be seen to possess his words. According to the text in the book of Psalms, I have laid up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, now what's he saying? Because I realized I read that and it was rather long. Um, first, he's saying, for you to bear any sort of virtue, Christ is the source of all goodness. Christ is the source of all virtue. So for you to have any virtue, it must come from Christ and you must be um, essentially having unison with Christ for him to abide in you and you in him. And what is this unison? It can't be that this unison by which you obtain virtues is just faith. It can't be that me saying, I know Christ and uh, he, I have belief in him, or I, have, I know God exists. That can't be the end goal of being able to attain virtues. Because he says, even the demons believe in God. Even the devils know who God is. And they have faith that God exists and then what he, they can do, he can do because they've seen it. Um, so if you just say faith, it doesn't make sense because the demons have no virtues, but yet they uh, know God exists. So it must be a piety toward God, he says, that should accompany this faith. 
it must be that I realize that God is the ultimate goal of my soul, of where my soul ought to rest, of what I long for, and that I love him and that he loves me, that I'm going to attain these virtues. That I'm going to have a real connection and relationship with him is where the virtues come in. Not merely just me coming to church, not merely just me uh, believing he exists, not merely just me going through the motions. It's a real relationship by which I get to know him that I attain these virtues. Like any relationship, the more we get to know somebody, the more we tend to um, reflect their habits in our life. And I think we see this in human interaction all the time. Like um, before I came to Toronto, I could think before I went to Yellowknife, before that I was in Toronto and before that I was in Ottawa. So when I was in Ottawa, I found I spoke very normally. And I don't know if this is uh, as much in the grads as it is as much in the youth. But when I moved to Toronto, I found um, the language, like with the youth I serve, is completely different. The high school kids, uh, they say things like mans, like, uh, like mans is marved, you know? Mans is hungry, marved, you know, marved means hungry. Did you know that? Like you're starving, it's marved. Or uh, my cousin Kosa once told me, nice me that, bro. And I said, like, what's nice? Like he said, nice me that. I said, what's nice? He said, you know, like, give it to me, pass it to me. And then I was like, this is the stupidest thing. It's so silly. I'm never going to use these words in my life. And then I lived in Toronto for, I don't know, at that point, just over a year. And suddenly I found myself saying, you know, nice me that. I found myself saying, like, we all want to go get coffee. I said, man's wants coffee. And I like the things I thought I never would have done in my life, I found myself doing. And then thankfully God took me away from here so that my language reverted back to regular English. But I very much became like those who I surrounded myself with because I developed a relationship with them. And the same with um, having a relationship with Christ. If I want to become Christ-like, if I want to attain the virtues by which Christ grants us as divine, I must have a true relationship with him. And once I have that relationship, and once I get to know him, and once I'm praying and he's communicating to me uh, through my prayers, through my Bible reading, through uh, liturgy, then I attain these virtues because he is the one I hold closest to me and that's a reflection in my life. And who derives this uh, benefit from the connection that I get with Christ? Uh, Augustine comments on this, St. Augustine. He says, I'm going to read this again. He says, um, Jesus said, abide in me and I in you they are not in him in the same kind of way that he is in them. Uh, he's essentially saying like the way we are in Christ is not the same in that it's not an equal trade-off of uh, abide in me and I in you. He says, and yet both ways tend to their advantage, there being us, not to his. For the relation of the branches to the vine is such that they contribute nothing to the vine, but derive their own means of life from it. While that of the vine to the branches is such that it supplies their vital nourishment and receives nothing from them. And so they're having Christ abiding in them and abiding themselves in Christ are in both respects advantageous, not to Christ, but to the disciples. For when the branch is cut off, another may spring up from the living root. But that which is cut off cannot live apart from the root. He's saying, and he's talking about the disciples, but really it applies to each and every single one of us. He's saying, what do we derive from this connection to the branch um, of us, of him being the vine and us being the branches. Uh, what does he derive? Nothing. You don't give anything to Christ. You don't increase Christ and you don't add to the glory of him by you having a relationship with him. Um, it's us who gain from him. We gain the source of life and the source of joy and the source of peace. And we gain all of this. And the role of Christ is uh, one in which he loves us back, but one in which he also supplies us the nourishment by which we live, which is him. The source of all life is, is God. And he provides us that nourishment. Um, so oftentimes we think we do things and it's for the benefit of God. Uh, specifically for myself, like I know sometimes in the service, it's like, you know, I am serving God and it will be like, God, at one point there was a time when there was too many days in a row. I felt like, and I was like, God, I came on Friday and I served you. And I came on Saturday and I served you. I came on Sunday and I served you. And now it's Monday and I'm going back to work. Like, at what point do I have any time for myself? And I like, found myself getting angry because I had all this service and I felt like my time was completely dedicated to time. 
uh, my time was completely dedicated to God and there was nothing left for me to like sit by myself and just chill. Uh, like when I can just binge watch 10 hours of Netflix or whatever. Um, and I thought that I had, a, uh, I had a poor mentality and I thought that God was somehow benefiting from me being there and serving where like, I'm ultimately nothing. If I, he, and Augustine says this, for when the branch is cut off, another may spring up from the living root. Like if I didn't come here and I didn't serve, someone else could surely take my place. And like, what I do is so minimal that it's not very hard to replace me. Um, but why am I serving? Um, why do we serve in any capacity, whether it be, you know, uh, providing a talk to the youth, whether it be setting up the church, whether it be um, giving to your brother that you see on the streets. Why do we serve? It's not because God gains anything from my service. It's not because it's of any benefit or adding to the glory of God. It's because it is to my own benefit. And um, it is I who receive blessings and get to know him more deeply through my service. Um, I've been talking for a while, so I'll try and wrap it up soon. Uh, but lastly, abiding in Christ. And I didn't talk about the most obvious abiding in Christ and, and the steps of the Eucharist and how the Eucharist is a medicine that helps us uh, heal ourselves and abide in him or him to heal us and for us to abide in him. I didn't talk about that because it's, it's obvious and we all, I think at this point, know the benefits of the Eucharist and the holy mystery that it is. But I'll talk about one more point about abiding in Christ and then we can wrap it up. Um, and how do we prepare ourselves to abide in him? We talked about the struggle. We talked about repentance. We talked about bearing fruit and having a real relationship with him. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about this thing. It's called, um, in Greek, the word is ekenosin. Like when St. Paul says he took the form of a bond servant, that term bond servant in Greek is ekenosin. And we, in English, we call it kenosis being the, um, the dogma that Christ uh, empties himself when he takes on human flesh. Uh, how does he empty himself? Um, Christ steps down. Uh, he's the second person of the Trinity, and he steps down to earth and takes human flesh. And the liturgy speaks to this on the Feast of the Nativity. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, gospel response to Madden's. Um, the gospel response to Madden's at the Feast of Nativity says, uh, for the one without flesh became flesh. I have to sing it to myself in my mind to remember. For the one without flesh became flesh. For the one without flesh became flesh. And the Logos became incarnate. The one without beginning began. The one outside of time became subject to time. Okay, there it is. Um, for the one without beginning, they recently changed the translation. It used to be began, they now changed it to was born. Uh, all the same, the one outside of time became subject to time. Christ is outside of time um, as he is divine, as he is God. And then he steps, he becomes incarnate and he takes on our flesh. And suddenly he empties himself and takes on these limitations of the flesh um, to the extent of you know, he's a baby, he has to be born, he has to learn language, he has to go through all these processes that we all go through, he gets tired, he gets hungry, he has to eat, um, he sleeps just like the rest of us. All these attributes that are not, um, that were never prior associated with divinity, they were only associated with humanity. And then he comes and he takes on our flesh, um, and he blesses our flesh, but he empties himself in the sense of he went from being outside of time to being subject to time, to being, uh, you know, uh, outside of this tiredness and this earth and this uh, and sickness and all of this to then taking on the flesh and dealing with everything we deal with um, to the point of even dealing with temptation, but never falling and remaining sinless. Um, so we, as Christ emptied himself, we ourselves are called to empty ourselves. Um, we're called to empty ourselves in a little a bit of a different sense, but we're also called to this uh, term, which I used, with, which, was, which was kenosis, coming from the Greek kenosis. We're called to this kenosis as well of emptying ourselves. We're called to empty ourselves of uh, sin and un unrighteousness so that uh, virtue may enter, so that uh, holiness may enter. 
so that the spirit of God may enter within us, um, so that we may know the Holy Spirit. Um, and thinking of this, like I, I can think of an example of, uh, I can think of a few examples, but um, about uh, a long time ago now, pre-COVID, um, we had rented a cottage, me and my friends and my brother, we hadn't seen each other for a long time because we had all been living in different cities. So we decided we we're gonna rent uh, a cottage in, the, in somewhere in Northern Ontario. I couldn't even tell you where at this point. But um, we found a place on Airbnb. Uh, it was called the Crown Jewel. It's really nice. We found this place on Airbnb and we went there and we, um, we spent three days there. But what do they tell you on the last day? They say, uh, be out of there by like 11 a.m. And it's like non-negotiable. You gotta be out of there at 11 a.m. because somebody else is coming to take your place after you. And why do you need to be out of there by 11 a.m.? Because they need to clean it. It's not until like the whole place is empty that they can then adequately clean and disinfect it from whatever may have been present at the time, uh, whatever filth or disease or COVID or whatever was in there. Until you empty the whole place, it's never going to be properly cleaned or disinfected. And we likewise are called to empty ourselves so that the Holy Spirit can come and dwell within us and purify us. Um, and sometimes we choose to fill ourselves with um, other things and it works to our disadvantage. Like, uh, it's like, I love, I love sushi. Uh, I love sushi buffets. And I, like the for, for the first 10 minutes, it's the most enjoyable thing of my life. And sushi is my favorite food. But eventually it gets to a point where nobody wants to despite loving sushi and despite like it being my favorite food during the last the first 10 minutes are the best time of my life the last 10 minutes is where i ruin a relationship with absolutely everybody and it's you know you ordered this so you take this and i'm not paying the surcharge on this and suddenly you're all pushing it away from you despite it being something i love and something uh i enjoy having uh why because i filled myself with other things at uh the same time like even if I gave you like 10 loaves of bread and you ate the 10 loaves of bread and I brought you like a Wagyu steak and I gave you the Wagyu steak, you wouldn't want to eat it because you'd be full. Um, so we have to be mindful spiritually as well. Like what am I filling myself with? Because there comes a point where I filled myself with so many things outside of God that there's no room left for him to come dwell within us and, and cleanse us. And it's not that we attain virtues and then God comes and dwells in us, like we think sometimes. It's not that, and this goes back to the conversation I was having on struggle. It's not that we stop struggling and God comes and dwells within us. Um, you know, we say, uh, the, the gospel says, for the fruits uh, of the spirit are love, joy, peace, and whatever. For the fruits of the spirit are. Not that, you know, you had these fruits and then the spirit came. It was a consequence that you attaining the spirit and you having a relationship and listening with God then brought forth these fruits. So we often think like, you know, the saints, we're in a time of prayer and fasting right now. And we think uh, the saints, because they are saints, they pray and they fast and they do good works and they spend time in the desert and whatever it might be, but that's because they are saints. But it's not like because they're saints, they pray and they fast. It's because they prayed and they fasted and they worked on their spiritual life that they eventually became saints. And you and I have the same abilities and the same capabilities of uh, attaining such level of sainthood. Um, and like, we ought not to think that like, you know, sainthood is so far away from us because we're always called to repentance. And we always have these abil this ability to grow closer to God. So it's not that, you know, wait till you become a saint and fast and pray. It's start fasting and praying now so that you may get to know him. Come to him and, you know, have a relationship with him, have a real relationship with him in that it's not, it's not going to be, Lord, I'm dirty now. I don't want to come speak to you. Lord, I'm not feeling well now. I don't want to come speak to you. Lord, I'll speak to you on church on Sundays, but not during the week because I'm so busy. Uh, it's, that's not how relationship works. Relationship isn't just something of following somebody's rules or, or uh, you know, only speaking to someone at certain times. Relationship is loving someone and regardless of the state being willing to engage with them and then as god is willing to engage with us regardless of our sin he's willing to forgive us and accept us it's coming to him and acknowledging like i've struggled i'm sitting i'm trying to do better 
I'm trying to empty myself. And from there, just trusting that his grace will come and will um, bless us, that his grace will come and, and will pour upon us. So it's, it's really trying to ultimately to have a relationship with him is where abiding in him starts. It's, it's coming to him daily, despite our falls, and it's coming to try and get to know him. Um, and like with any relationship, you know, it's not going to be like, I see you on, I'm only going to see you on Sundays, because if you imagine nobody's going to go to their wife and be like, I'm only going to see you on Sundays. That wouldn't be a real relationship. So if you want to get to know him, you have to certainly put in the effort to have a relationship with him and acknowledge that he's uh, a loving God who, despite our weaknesses and our sins, is willing to accept us and have um, a relationship with us. And then we will struggle, but we'll grow virtues because he is divine. And we will get to know him and he'll give us the peace uh, in our life. And I think I can stop there and glory be to God for everyone. I can stop the recording. Yeah, yeah. I think stop. Yes.